Our Bible reading this morning is from Galatians chapter 5, and we're reading from verses 16 to 26. Life by the Spirit, it's called. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Amen, and thanks be to God for his word. Well, this is a first for me. I'm preaching the same sermon as I did a wee while ago. So if you were here earlier, <laughs> a double dose today. <laughs> Lovely. Well, this morning, as we've just read, we're looking at Galatians chapter 5 on the theme of the Holy Spirit as a fruit grower. And this fruit we will discover grows as we walk and we live in the Spirit. Or as the Amplified Translation puts it, and I love this one, to be responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit. Now, as I was thinking about this, a wee story came to mind from many years ago when I was training to become a PE teacher. I spent three weeks at an outward bound centre up in Applecross. I don't know if you know that part of Scotland. It's absolutely stunning, isn't it? Beautiful. So we did some sailing around the island of Rassi. We did some rock climbing in the Torridon mountain range. And we did some sea canoeing, and I'm going to say now, I only did it then, and I've never done it since, and I'm not doing it again. <laughs> that was an experience, only once. Uh, we had to be rescued that day, my lifeboat, actually. Anyway, and also we did some hill walking. Now, it was during one of the hill walks that the leader of the group instructed us to keep close and to keep in line, as some of the paths were narrow, uh, and we were moving up onto higher ground. Now, at one point, he stopped suddenly and he shouted, everyone, sit down exactly where you are. And of course, we're all wondering what's going on here, you know. But what we hadn't seen or realized was that a mist had very suddenly descended on the hill. And before we knew it, we could hardly see two feet in front of us. And we sat there for half an hour or more until the mist lifted. Now I've never forgotten that, never forgotten it. Uh, and what it taught me was that very suddenly your situation can change. You could be nearer to a cliff edge than you thought. But more than that was the importance <clears throat> of keeping in step and of keeping in line with the leader and his instructions. Now, why do I mention this wee story? Well, sometimes the journey of our life is well marked out and the way is easy. While at other times, 
we don't know what lies ahead and we have to sort of hack out a path as it were in order to get through to our destination but as Christians our journey started it began the day we put our trust in Jesus and our acceptance of him as our saviour and instead of a leader instructing and encouraging us on our way for us as followers of Jesus that is the work of the Holy Spirit living in us and through us as we are all continually as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18 were transformed into the same image of Christ so in verse 16 this is what Paul's encouraging the believers in Galatia to do and it speaks to us as well to stay close to keep in step and to walk in the spirit but and there's always a but <laughs> there is a battle going on between living in the spirit that is in the power of God and living by the flesh and that is the human sinful nature without God with all its unlovely impulses and its appetites and here's what John MacArthur he's an American pastor and author this is what he said he said the spirit led life is a life of conflict because it is in constant combat with the old ways of the flesh that continue to tempt and seduce the believer now I don't know if you're a fan of a tug of war you know you get these tug of war competitions going on usually at gala days but the tug of war that is going on within us it is relentless it's relentless and Paul goes on to say that the flesh and the spirit are opposed to each other and they prevent you from doing what you want to do and I'll be really honest this week as I have prepared this word there's been tug of wars going on within me and I won't go into anything personal that's been happening but it's there all the time let's be honest it is and in other words it's that downward pull and the pressure of our lower nature it is always at work trying to prevent us from living a life of obedience and victory in the spirit but here's another but <laughs> here is the good news and we all love good news don't we as believers and followers of Jesus when we walk in the spirit and we allow him to guide our conduct wherever we go and whatever we do we can allow him to do that now let's get practical here what does that mean for you and for me in our everyday living as I said let's be honest we come daily with this face-to-face -face conflict that goes on within us between the flesh and the spirit and the challenge for us is to walk and be responsive and controlled as we read earlier by the spirit and it is a challenge it's a challenge not to be afraid to admit our faults it's a challenge to be humble and sensitive to the spirit to know that we when we've offended or we've hurt someone then we're quick to respond we're quick to seek forgiveness and reconciliation and our flesh does not want to do that but if we allow the spirit to guide us then he will give us the victory so practically speaking we live under the controlling influence of the spirit as we continually expose our minds to seek and to obey his will for us as revealed in scripture as well as live in dependence on him through prayer as we continually seek him for his power to rise above our fleshly impulses and so enable us to obey his will indeed as Paul says in verse 18 there if we are led by the spirit then we are not under the law but we have a live in person to keep us in line and to keep us in step but another but sinful nature and desires they are strong 
And Paul goes on in verses 19 to 21. He gives a catalogue of the works of the flesh. And they're plain. They are plain to everyone to see. And they cover three main areas. Sexual immorality, religious idolatry, and relationship with one another through rivalry, divisions, envy, and so on. Now, we don't want to dwell on these this morning, but suffice to say that Paul gives a strong warning, as he did before. He's already warned the believers in Galatia against these vices, and he's referring, what he's referring to in this uh, passage is their habitual practice of them. And said that those involved in these kind of things, they won't inherit God's kingdom. But <laughs> there's more good news. Yes, there's more. And it is exciting, I believe. Because in contrast to walking according to the flesh, we see the results of walking in the spirit as a fruit grower within us. And verse 22, it begins... But the fruit of the Spirit is. Now right away we notice it's fruit, singular. Not fruits, plural. It's all one fruit. All one fruit. And there are nine qualities characterizing that fruit which the Holy Spirit wants to grow and develop in each of us. So what are these qualities? that the Spirit wants us to experience and evidence in our lives so that fruit may grow within us. And we're just going to look at these briefly this morning. And again, they cover three main areas. And the first one is in relation to God. There they are, love, joy, and peace. And the love it speaks of here, well, it's a self-sacrificing and it's a Christ-like love. We're probably all familiar with that famous passage in 1 Corinthians 13. It's read so often at weddings. It speaks of love that's patient, love that's kind. It rejoices in the truth. It always trusts, it hopes, and it perseveres. And then there's a joy. Well, it's not based on outward circumstances only or happiness, but it's a deep inner rejoicing in Jesus that is within us. Now, as I read this and I prepared this, I was thinking of a Sunday school song that I used to sing many years ago in the Sunday school. I'm hoping there are others here who have sung this. <laughs> I'm not the only one. I think there's two people. <laughs> I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Woohoo, good. And then we all got, it was great. Then we all used to sing as loud as we could. Where? And then we sing it again. Yeah, it was a great wee song. And it's always stayed with me. That's where the joy of the Spirit is. It's deep down within us. That's where it is. And then following on from that, there is the quality of peace. Now, it's different from the peace that the world can give us. It passes all understanding, as Philippians 4 and 7 says. And I discovered that the root word for peace in this verse is rest and quietness which God gives to us in the midst of trials and difficulties. We could probably all come up here and give a testimony to that, to the reality of that. It can't be rationalized. It passes all our understanding. So these qualities, the first three are in relation to God, and then the next three are in relation to one another. Here they are, patience, kindness, and goodness. Now, this is a patience that can endure when things and people anger us, annoy us, or harass us. We've all been there. Yes, and we do get frustrated. Then there's a kindness that's evidenced by a gracious nature and a temper. And that is not always easy to let that fruit grow in us. And lastly, there's a quality of goodness. Now, goodness is really love in action. It's a love that's ready to do good, for others and to others. So there we have qualities in relation to God, qualities in relation to one another, and then finally we've got these three qualities in relation to our own inner life. What are they? Their faithfulness, their gentleness, and their self-control. 
Now, this is a faithfulness that keeps us constant and steadfast. Hebrews 12 and 1, one of my favorite Bible verses, encourages us to run the race that's set before us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus as he calls us out to live our life, to live our life, our faith by being faithful to him. Then there's a gentleness that comes from a state of humility and meekness. Now, meekness does not mean weakness, but controlled strength, where pride doesn't raise its ugly head, it's not easily angered or feels the need for revenge, but it's quick to let things go uh, and forgive. This is the fruit the Holy Spirit wants to grow in us. Now, as I thought about this, a story came to me from a book that I read by Corrie Ten Boom. You've probably read many of her books. The Hiding Place is one of my favorites. And she tells this story <clears throat> about the need for forgiveness at that point in her life. She was confronted by a former SS uh, guard from the Ravensbrück con concentration camp who after a meeting came up to her and wanted to shake her hand and thank her for sharing about God's forgiveness and his love because he needed it and he'd received it and accepted it in Jesus. Well, she struggled to raise her hand, she says, and could not find that forgiveness for him within herself. And in that moment, she desperately asked God by his spirit to give her his forgiveness. And she recalls as she raised her arm to take his hand, incredibly, there sprang a love for this man who had been her enemy, and it almost overwhelmed her. And she says the great discovery she made at that moment was that when God tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love and the forgiveness itself. And there at that point, the Holy Spirit, she allowed the Holy Spirit to lead and control her. And so finally, with these last three, there is the quality of self-control that involves moderation, constraint, and the ability to say no to our fleshly desires and our thoughts and our words and our actions. So when we look at these qualities, the fruit of the Spirit, what I discovered as I prepared this, they counter every one of the works of the flesh. Now, isn't that good news? And isn't that exciting for us? And God wants every one of these qualities to be present in our lives as followers of Jesus. Now, someone has said these nine qualities are a packaged deal. You can't just pick and choose which ones you want, just like you would do when you're out shopping. Now, I've brought a bowl of fruit with me this morning. There are nine different qualities, if you like, or flavors or types of fruit in that bowl. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm out shopping, I tend to pick my favorites, and right away I go for the bananas, because they're one of my favorites. <clears throat> but these qualities of the spirit we're looking at today, they are a packaged deal. We don't just pick our favorites. As we walk in the Spirit, we allow the Holy Spirit to be the fruit grower within us of all the qualities of the Spirit. And the challenge for us can be uh, to look at these qualities of the Spirit and say to ourselves, well, I need to be more loving. I need to be more loving. I need to be more patient. I need to exercise more self-control. But they aren't given to us as goals to pursue because you and I, we cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit is the producer and we are the fruit bearers. We cannot magically generate these qualities in our lives. It is a work of the Spirit of God within us. As Jesus said in John 15 and 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So we are completely dependent on him 
and we're only fruit bearers by his enabling and power at work within us by his spirit and it's only as we walk in the spirit that the fruit will flourish now I'm just going to finish by going back to the story that I shared with you at the beginning yes we did reach the top of that hill safely and back down again and it was only because we kept in line and in step with the leader and his instructions how thankful were we so it will be in our lives that the Holy Spirit will be the fruit grower in us and we will bear fruit as we keep in step and allow ourselves to be led and controlled by him Amen let's say a short prayer Father God how we thank you for the continual work of your Holy Spirit in our lives help us to keep abiding in you to keep depending on you to lead and to guide us that your fruit may grow in us and that we might bear much fruit for you in your name we pray Amen <laughs>